really sorry because at 12.10 I have to go for something urgent. Uh, we're going to have an extra makeup class uh, uh, tomorrow uh, at 11.30 in the mathematics seminar room. Okay. Uh, so just for those who came late, I'm, today's going to be a very short class, like half an hour class, because I have to go for something urgent at 12.10. I'm sorry about this. Okay. So, but we're having our makeup class tomorrow uh, in the mathematics seminar room. Okay. So now let's, let's move quickly. Okay. So in the last class, we derived Einstein's equations. And in this class, we want to start using Einstein's equations. Okay. Um, so we want to start using Einstein's equations. Uh, but before we start using it in de uh, these equations in detail, which will be much of this class, um, the, uh, the first thing we're going to try to do is to try to understand the, the, the non-relativistic or the Newto Newtonian limit of the Einstein equations. Okay, so you remember that in a previous class we had uh, uh, checked that um, um, provided G00 is equal to 1 plus 2 phi, okay, Provided G00 is 1 plus 2 phi, test particles in a background metric will, in the appropriate limit, test particles in a background metric will, in the appropriate limit, behave as if they are subjected to Newtonian potential phi. Okay? And the appropriate limit was, uh, let me say, it was, of course, that uh, G is equal to 1 plus, uh, uh, plus epsilon times H some degree of smallness in epsilon and uh, um, we had also that uh, velocities velocity squares were like uh, 1 plus epsilon uh, well sorry were of epsilon so velocity squares were of the same order of smallness Okay, so velocity is like a measure of x distance by time distance. Okay, so velocity squares were of the same order of smallness as uh, uh, the deviation of the metric from flat space. And the way to see that those had to be of the same order was uh, uh, to note that in the Newtonian theory, phi and v squared are often exchanged in ordinary motion. So a planet that has only phi, or oh, a ball up here that has only phi at the top, has v squared at the bottom, but v squared and phi are of the same order. Right, so uh, v squared and phi were of the same order. This was the, the Newtonian limit under, under consideration. Okay, so what we're interested now is in looking at what Einstein's equations become in this limit. So we, we look at the limit in which g squared is 1 plus epsilon of uh, epsilon times h, and these squares are small. Now, how do we precise the statement these squares are small? Okay. Um, the kind of thing that we want to say is that, now, v, this is sort of like delta x by delta t. The whole thing squared is all epsilon. Okay. So, um, so what, what we're saying is that in the configurations that we're looking at, time derivatives. One of the things we're saying is that time derivatives are of order square root epsilon times space derivatives. Because d by dx is like 1 over a, a spatial distance. D by dt is like 1 over a time distance. So this will give us delta x by delta t is of order epsilon. Square it, we get this. Okay? So we're interested in the limit in which things are varying much faster in... Uh, um, this is of the order of Right. But a derivative is 1 over delta x. <laughs> okay? So this is 1 by delta t is order ep square root epsilon times 1 by delta x. So delta x by delta t, whole thing squared, is of order square root epsilon. That is of order epsilon. Okay? Um, so basically this tells us that time derivatives are much smaller than space derivatives by a factor of square root epsilon. And we want to examine Einstein's equations in this limit. Okay. Now, we don't really care. What we want to see is that Newton's laws come out of Einstein's equations. Okay. Now, 
as we've seen, as in order to get Newton's laws, all that's important is that g0 zero, zero takes the form 1 plus 2 phi, where phi is the Newtonian potential. Uh, we got agreement with, with motion in a Newtonian potential, provided that all g's were 1 plus order epsilon, and g0 zero, zero was of this form. It didn't matter to us what gij was. Do you remember that? Okay. So all we have to demonstrate is that g0 zero, zero when written as 1 plus something, is that, that something becomes a Newtonian potential. The gij's can be whatever they want. It doesn't affect the Newtonian limit, the strict Newtonian limit. Okay. So what we want to do is to find an equation for g0, 0, sorry. Uh, what we want to do is to find an equation for uh, the, uh, the deviation from uh, g0, 0. So we'll write g0, 0 is equal to 1 plus h0, 0. zero. And try to find one of Einstein's equations that in this limit of smallness gives us an autonomous equation just for h0, 0. So the equation we look at is this one. The equation we look at is that, okay. Now, there's something else that I should have said. This, the something else that I should have said is, uh, so far we've been looking at Einstein's equations, so the Einstein, Einstein part of the equations. But there's also the matter. But we're looking at the non-relativistic limit in matter. So imagine that the matter is made up of a bunch of non-relativistic objects moving around. Okay? Um, in this limit, the rest energy, the stress tensor of this, this, this system is dominated by the rest energy of the system. Right? So, T0,0 zero, zero is going to be much, much larger than... Okay, it's going to be of order... T0i will be of order Vi times T0,0. Zero, zero. Is this clear? And... Uh, 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 and the Tij will be will, will be down even 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 smaller. Tij will have a vi vj in it. it. Will be of order v square compared to uh, t zero zero. So the dominant term on the right hand side is uh, t zero zero, and uh, um, t zero zero is larger than t zero i by a factor of square root epsilon, and t zero i is factor by, by uh, is larger than Tij by another factor of square root epsilon. Okay, so that's the other thing that we're going to use, because the matter itself is assumed to be non-relativistic. So, but given all these assumptions, we, we want to check that we get back Newton's equations. Okay, so now let's look at this, this equation. R0,0, zero, zero, um, uh, well, what was Einstein's equation? So Einstein's equation was that R mu nu is equal to 8 pi k, uh, we're dropping the c's, um, T mu nu minus half delta mu nu T. Okay? So, keeping things just to leading order on the right hand side. Okay? Um, what we're going to do is to reduce everything here just to the to the T0,0 zero zero parts. What? This should be an R, you're saying? Okay, good. Uh, so that's something that I forgot to tell you about last time. Let's, let's, let's move back to R. So R mu nu, we had R mu nu minus half R by 2 uh, delta mu nu is equal to, uh, how was it, 8 pi k times t mu nu. Okay? Now there's another way of writing this equation that we can get by just tra uh, taking the trace of both sides of this equation. So if I take the trace on both sides of this equation, what do I get? I get R uh, by 2. Wait, so, so let me be careful here. The trace of this guy is just R. The trace of this guy is 4 times R. But there's a uh, by 2 here. So it's, that's a minus 2 times R. So this is minus R. Okay? Is equal to 8 pi k times t. Okay? So, let me plug this in here. So, now, what do I get? I get r mu nu uh, plus 4 pi k times t delta mu nu is equal to 8 pi 
k t mu nu which implies that r mu nu is equal to 8 by k in a t mu nu minus half minus t by 2 delta mu nu. Okay? So this is an equivalent way of writing Einstein's equations. This and this are the same equation. Okay? This is the form that I'm going to, going to find more convenient for what I'm talking about now. Is this clear? Okay. So, um, the next thing I'm going to do is to try to understand uh, I'm going to take this equation. So, no, I'm sorry, I'm extra chaotic today. We're going... Uh, uh, okay, we're now going to write here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. So, now what I'm going to do is now take the indices mu and nu to be 0 and 0. So, we get the equation R0,0 0, 0 is equal to 8 pi k. Then there's a T0,0. Zero, zero. Okay. And we get minus delta 0, 0, so that's 1 times half of T. But half of t, uh, since we are only keeping lead, uh, leading on on the right hand side, we can replace that. Uh, what, what was t? t was t00 zero, zero, plus t11 one, one, plus t22 two, two, plus t33, three, three, one index lower, one index higher, uh, one index up, one index down. And we're only going to keep the leading order term. So this was half of t00, zero, zero. keeping just the leading order. Okay? So we've got R0,0 zero, zero is equal to 4 pi k times T0,0. Zero, zero. In the approximation in which we're keeping things, this is what one of Einstein's equations be, becomes. Okay. Now to further process this. this so, remember, I'll keep this on the board because this is, we want to, we're going to write G0,0 is zero, 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 1 plus 2 phi and find an equation for phi. Okay. Let's go there slowly. So we've got um, um, we've got this equation now, and I want to process this R zero zero. So firstly, let's remember what uh, uh, let's remember the formula for R A B C D. Okay. So th the formula of R A B C D was what? It was gamma A B. Um, and then uh, we had uh, C comma D minus gamma A B D comma C plus terms that are quadratic in gamma. Now, if we write G as 1 plus order epsilon, the Christoffel symbols are obviously of order epsilon. Because they involve derivatives of the metric and one has no derivative. So Christoffel symbol square is obviously of order epsilon square. And we're going to only, going, only going to be keeping this equation to order epsilon. The minus sign is wrong. The minus sign is wrong? The first one is a minus sign, the second one is plus. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Um, now, uh, uh, that's right. Huh? Okay, I would have to take. Okay, I, I believe. You. Okay. Uh, del C, del C, del C. Del C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Del C. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Del C. Let me write it as plus. Okay. Good. Yes. And okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So we only need to keep these two terms. Okay. Moreover. Every term that we're keeping has at least one factor of the small metric. As we said, so this automatically of order epsilon. So any further smallnesses, we kill it. What does that mean? That means that all derivatives that we're taking should be space derivatives. Okay? So now let's actually, um, let's process the formula for R. So firstly now, what was uh, R? Uh, we want to contract the first and third indices to get R. So we get A, um, so gamma A, A, 
and now we want okay and then of course we, we the, this is going to give us r 0 0 with both indices lower but the difference between upper and lower is a factor of g inverse which differs from delta at one higher order of smallness so we ignore that so r 0 0 with both uppers is the same as r 0 0 with both lowers because we're using the signature no minus sign because we're using the signature plus minus 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 okay so to the same order what we're interested in is okay so let me be more systematic so r 0 0 which is the same as r 0 0 to the order in which we're working is equal to gamma a a 0 0 minus gamma uh, first and third first and third first and third oh, sorry I did this wrong sorry first and third a and c gamma a a uh, 0 0 minus gamma a a 0 0 okay now we've decided that because all these are already order epsilon, any further smallnesses, for instance, by differentiating with respect to zero, should be ignored. So we ignore this term. Is this clear? So all that remains is this guy. So we've got gamma a zero zero comma a. Now this a runs over all values, but we'll only allow it to run over space because we don't want a time derivative. So gamma i zero zero, uh, zero i. Fine. So now all we need to do is to compute this gamma i is zero, zero zero i. But we know how to compute that. That is equal to minus half g zero zero comma i plus terms that will involve time derivatives, which we're going to throw away. Okay. So we've concluded. From here, that this equation in the uh, in the uh, uh, Newtonian limit that we're considering simply boils down to minus half g zero zero comma i is equal to eight pi sorry four pi k t zero zero. Okay. Now we'll substitute g zero zero. We this is. Basically, we've met our objective. We've got an equation that autonomously, de uh, uh, autonomously determines g00, forgetting about all the others. Okay? And uh, now we just, uh, um, uh, now we just, oh, sorry. And there was another i, yeah. So this is del square, spatial del square. Okay? So now we substitute g00 as this. So we get uh, uh, minus del square phi is equal to 4 pi k. Now this we can call mass density, energy density, it doesn't matter. Because we're setting c equals 1, we're working at non-relativistic limit. Okay. And this is, of course, Newton's equation. Once you identify, uh, well, in some convention, once you identify... Uh, the gravitational constant, Newton's constant, as how? Uh, yeah, k is g bit with what four pi's. Uh, okay, I think this is k is what? Yeah, k is g. Right. So k is equal to g. It's Newton's constant. Once we make this identification, we've got Newton's law. Newton's law of gravitation. Okay. So in the appropriate limit, neglecting many things that are small in appropriate circumstances, and these inappropriate circumstances include motion of the Earth around the Sun, for instance. Okay, we've recovered Newton's equations. So we see that Einstein's equations, while much, much, much uh, bigger than Newton's equations, Newton's equations of gravity, much more beautiful, much more complicated, having much more structure, reduced to it in the right limit, which is of course a necessary condition for it to be the right equation of gravity, since Newton's equations have been fabulously tested, for instance, in planetary motion. Okay? Questions or comments about this? Okay. 
So now let's move on. Now we understand that these equations reduce to, uh, 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 reduce to Newton's equations. So, uh, oh, this one? Well, oh. This minus sign is the minus sign, right? Just the minus sign is not right, right? So, we've messed up on the minus sign. Well, did I, how did I do this? I'm sorry. Sorry, I've messed up the minus sign. The minus sign shouldn't be there. Uh, let me, let me look at that. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wait, and what is this? Correct. Oh, where did this minus sign? Sorry. Oh, no, 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 that was okay. The minus sign is okay? Let's see. Um, let's see. Let's to, 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 to check uh, what, what is the gravitational potential of a delta function source according to this equation. Um, so according to this equation, uh, if we do the Stokes theorem kind of business, I mean the Gauss theorem kind of business, then integral of del phi over uh, the surface will be equal to something negative. Okay. Uh, so that would tell us that the gravitational potential um, is equal to 1 by r so that its gradient is minus r hat by r square. Okay, not bad. That's, that's the usual answer, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, fine. Okay, maybe we've not missed them. Maybe I just was checking with Landau Lifshitz. They've got the opposite sign. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. One, 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 wait, 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 I think we have messed up. I, you know, in this, sorry, we have messed up here. Because we, we, we're using this weird metric. You see, we have this gamma ii. Now, I want to write this in terms of both indices lower. Because that's what del i squared is. It's del x times del x. Okay? And uh, uh, the, just to say it again, that this formula that I wrote down was a formula for the gamma with all three indices lower. Then there was a G inverse of the upper index. There was a G inverse of the upper index, and uh, in spatial directions, G inverse in our conventions has a minus sign. Sorry. So, okay. So this is what we're getting. Now, uh, now you've confused me into thinking this is not this should not be what we're getting. Okay. Uh, 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 what? K is minus g. No, 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 no. I think he wants k equals g. Just, just a minute. Uh, now we just have to remember Newton's laws. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, how does it normally go? What? Well, let, let's look. The gra the gravitational force should be attractive. Okay. So the gradient of the gravitational potential should be negative. So the gravitational potential should be positive. And this sign gives us that. Right? One, potential 1 by r gives us force minus r hat by r square, which is correct. Okay, so we, so this is what we expect if k is equal to g. No, 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 no. Force should be attractive. Force should be attractive. So 1 by r. Now differentiate. Forces minus grad phi. Forces minus grad phi. Okay. Okay. So the question is with this 1 by 2 phi, did we get t 
minus t minus v or t plus v in our when we looked at our square. Okay, let's let's get this straight. <laughs> Let's go back. Suppose we looked at our uh, at the motion of a particle. Okay, so this was square root g mu nu dx mu dx nu. Now this thing came with a uh, minus m. Okay. Now in this we write minus m integral square root of one plus two phi. Uh, we put a dt here, so that's 1 minus dx i minus v squared. Squared. And you're right that, uh, that what we're getting here is, uh, so the action is turning out to be uh, m dx i by dt, the whole thing squared minus m phi. Okay, so this was our action. Now, as you say, this will give us, um, so we, when we differentiate, we will get acceleration, minus, minus acceleration, minus grad phi is, e is equal to zero. So acceleration is equal to grad phi. So force, as you say, thank you, is minus grad phi. Correct. So the force is minus grad phi. So minus grad phi should be negative. Okay. Uh, that's right. So minus grad phi is negative. Grad phi is positive. Therefore, phi should be negative. Uh, according to Landau Lifshitz, well, you know, we should be able to work consistently. In writing 1 plus 2 phi, we've identified it with the potential. Okay? So now, uh, unless we flip our sign of k, something is. Uh, just one minute. Have I messed up somewhere else? Uh, uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, maybe we have got it right. Okay, let's 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 keep thinking. Now, uh, yeah, I think it's all okay. Look, see, we wanted, um, we wanted grad phi to be positive. Okay. Sorry about this. We want a grad phi to be positive, but that's consistent with del square phi is equal to this. Because del square phi is in integrated over a volume, is integral grad phi over the surface. And so if grad phi is positive, so that the force is negative, this is actually positive. So I'm saying that the solution to this will be minus 1 by r. The solution to uh, del square phi is equal to positive delta function is minus 1 by r. <laughs> okay, sorry about this. Sorry about this. This was embarrassing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, then it all works. Okay. So, now we are all happy with our signs. It all works. Uh, we believe that Newton was correct. Gravity is attractive rather than repulsive as we were finding <laughs> briefly. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, and we're all happy. Okay. Now, the, the next thing we want to do is to go beyond. Uh, the next thing we want to do is to go beyond uh, uh, working this Newtonian approximation because it's great that it reproduces Newton's laws approximately, but we want to see what ha what happens exactly. Okay, so uh, though I'm only going to be able to teach for the next six minutes, I have something urgent to do at ten past twelve. We'll have to continue this mainly tomorrow, but let's start setting it up. The thing that we want to do is to try to solve Einstein's equations in some interesting situations. And the most interesting situation is like to try to understand the, well, an obvious first thing to do is try to understand planetary motion around the sun. So we want to find the, gra the solution to Einstein's equations due to the sun. Okay? But we're going to do this in a way that uh, is a little more general than 
than we need to be so that we can use it in other situations as well. So, let us try to set up Einstein's equations. Let us try to set up Einstein's equations in... Ah, I remember. Yeah. So, let us try to set up Einstein's equations um, in, uh, uh, in a manner that, that is... That you that that is correct for any spherically symmetric situation. Okay, at the moment we won't uh, assume that this, the situation is static, but we will assume spherical symmetry. Okay, so what does spherical symmetry mean? Spherical symmetry means that you know things in that direction and that direction are the same around a given origin. Okay, so the metric in our situation should have rotational symmetry. Symmetry of rotational rotations around this origin point. Okay? So, what does that mean? That means that the metric should have a factor. Okay, so let me write down what it means. And then you tell me if you agree with this. This fixes the metric to take the following form. Firstly, um, first thing we have to do, you know, when, when we're dealing with Einstein's equations, you might ask metric in what coordinates? Okay? Uh, I'm going to work in general coordinates except for the metric on the sphere. You see, because we've got rotational invariance, then it must be, it must be possible to foliate our space-time into two spheres, into a two-parameter set of two spheres. Because what does it mean to have rotational invariance? You take one point, okay? you rotate it, you go to another point, which is physically equivalent to the first point. Okay. Now, if you take any point in space and rotate it in all possible ways, what does it generate? It generates a two-sphere. Okay? But a two-sphere is just a two-dimensional object. Space-time is four-dimensional. So you must, it must be possible to take space-time and foliate it in a two-parameter set of two-spheres to generate all four dimensions of space-time. Okay? So on the two-spheres, on the points that are uh, related by symmetry, by rotational symmetry, uh, to any other point, we're going to use standard coordinates, standard polar coordinates of the two sphere. So we'll use the angle, we'll use the coordinates theta and phi. This, by the way, is something very, this procedure is something very general, that while, while in general there's no preferred coordinate system in Einstein's equations, once you're looking at a situation with a certain amount of symmetry, that picks out a very natural set of coordinates, which is always advantageous to use. Okay? Because we're looking at, uh, at uh, uh, solutions with rotational symmetry in the two-sphere, we'll use coordinates that are naturally adapted to that symmetry on part of, this, uh, on part of space. What about the other two coordinates? So far, we make no assumptions. They're just two, two other completely random coordinates. Let's call them R and T. Why should there be a sphere? Why should there be a sphere? Because you have this rotational symmetry. That, that, that I understand the first two coordinates should be in this field. What about the other two? The other two could be anything. They need not be on No, no. They are completely arbitrary coordinates. They will, the range will in general... Yeah. What? The two dimension. Right. Okay? And then the requirement of rotational symmetry is that the metric take the form ds squared is equal to uh, minus dt squared into some function plus dt let's say dt dr into some other function plus dr squared into some other function plus a third function let's not call it d because it e times a, a d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared where a is equal to A of RT, B is equal to B of RT, C is equal to C of RT, and so on. E is equal to E of RT. Okay. Now, just to be totally clear, what does it mean that this metric here has spherical symmetry? What does it mean as a mathematical statement? Okay. What it means is that there is a change of coordinates. This change of coordinates is generated by rotations. Under which, so such that in the new coordinates, 
the metric has the same expression. And the metric has the same expression as a function of new coordinates as it had as a function of old coordinates. That's always what a symmetry means in physics. There's some change of variables such that something doesn't change form as a function of new variables compared to a function of old variables. Okay? Now, the rotation here is how does rotations act on this metric? Well, exactly the way rotations act on a two-sphere in theta phi coordinates. Okay? And it's obvious that this metric, this rotation doesn't touch the T and, phi, uh, T and R coordinate. It acts only on this part of the space. And from the fact that the metric of a two-sphere is rotationally invariant, okay, the rotational invariance of this full metric follows. I've been pedantic, you know. What I'm saying is obvious. Don't let it confuse you. But just to ma make sure you understand exactly what it means. Okay? For instance, phi goes to phi plus delta phi is obviously a symmetry of this metric. Because if, in the new phi prime coordinate, it takes the same form as in the phi coordinate. Now, what, what ensured that it was a symmetry of the metric? First, that the metric of the sphere took this form. But secondly, that there was no phi of theta dependence in these functions. Okay? Had there been phi dependence in these functions, then phi goes to phi plus delta phi would not have been a, a, an isometry of this metric. Okay? How do we know that this is the most general rotationally invariant function on the sphere? The reason is that the only... Okay, so it's sort of clear that this part of the metric has to be the metric of the sphere. But could we have had some function of theta and phi entering here that was rotationally invariant? And the answer is no. There's no rotationally invariant scalar function on the sphere apart from the constant. This you know from your study of spherical harmonics. All functions can be expanded in spherical harmonics. And the only spherical harmonic, the spherical harmonics transform in representations of the rotation group. The 0, 1, 2, up to infinity representations of the rotation group. The only one that's rotationally invariant is the one representation and that's the constant. Okay? So the only scalar function, the only combination of theta and phi that can appear here is some function of your coordinates on the sphere, some scalar function. That is invariant at rotations and there's no such function apart from the constant. So these things could not have depended on theta and phi without sacrificing rotational invariance. Okay? So this is the most general metric that preserves rotational invariance. Is this clear? Okay? Now this has greatly simplified our task. It's greatly simplified our task for two reasons. Firstly, we know a lot about the structure of the metric in theta and phi. And secondly, all these other uh, functions are not functions of four variables, but only functions of two variables. So in a sense, imposing uh, 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 rotational invariance has made the problem of solving uh, uh, Einstein's equations roughly as easy as it is to solve Einstein's equations in two dimensions, which is a very easy task. Uh, as you will see in some problem sets. Okay, so, um, so, so, uh, uh, so this now is more or less a solvable problem, as we will, as we will indicate. Okay, uh, but unfortunately not today, because I have to run. So uh, we'll continue tomorrow at 11.30, math mathematics seminar room. Sorry about this. Okay, I'll just run immediately since I'm doing this late anyway.